Hello. So last week we did health bar UI stuff. Um, that episode ended up being rather long and maybe a little bit uh, technical. I don't know. I, I took some detours into some technical stuff that um, I felt like I should explain as we went uh, since it's a pitfall to avoid. But that did mean it was kind of dry. So I want to do some more fun stuff this week. Um, what I'd like to do is... I think we should have enemies spawn in our world continuously um, so that there's not just this finite amount of stuff to kill that, that, and then the game is over. Um, and then I think we'll make them explode on death and have those explosions able to damage other enemies so you can cause like, chain reactions. Um, so all of that... Uh, our, our level is absurdly small. <laughs> so I think our first thing to do is to make that bigger. Uh, so, like we did in the first place, I'm going to get the camera, the scene camera, to a place where I want it, and then we'll set the game camera to match it. Uh, I am paying attention to the axes up here, where I want Z to be pointing away from us, because that's kind of our forwards direction, um, and that's just a useful reference point. If I, if the camera's up here, we can make a much bigger level, can we? And it's, it's still pretty clear what's going on. Um, so now I select the game, the main camera, and do game object align with view. We should find that the game view now looks just like our scene view. Uh, and that means we can make the floor much bigger. Um, I might also... I wonder if we should move the floor down. Uh, for now, I'm just going to make it bigger. So, like 50 wide. Uh, and 30 deep. Hmm. Yeah, that's probably wide enough. Uh, I might actually make the view a bit more vertical. And just do the same thing again. Align your view. And then these walls, um, I definitely... Uh, <laughs> I can't select the walls anymore. Okay, now I can. Um, I want them... I, I definitely want this left wall to still exist. But I'm thinking about maybe just getting rid of some of the others. Uh, let's get rid of the opposite one. Uh, and then do we want both of these? Maybe we do. Obviously they all need to be bigger in the longest dimension. These will be 50... This will be 50, and this one was, was it? let's do 34 because it was 24 before. Uh, none of this is, is very exact yet, uh, but we can just look at the figures it's given us and round them. Let's see if it's probably 15.5, nope, 16, <laughs> 156, nope. <laughs> okay, that's good. Um, and then this one, let's just see how it joins up. Pretty close, 16. All right, let's uh, let's also. I mean, we start crazy close. What I'm thinking is we'll spawn enemies from the left over here, so maybe we we start over to the right, and we can uh, probably use this way. If I click an enemy and then shift click the next one, the bottom one, uh, I can move them all at once like this. That's kind of handy, uh, and I could even if I find the ones that are further forwards. Uh, move those in and have them sort of start over here. It doesn't really matter because we're about to make them spawn anyway. Uh, I just want to be able to test this level without being immediately killed. <laughs> okay. Uh, that all works. Um, and... Yeah. Uh, that's fine. The fact that there's, they're missing all those is not really important. I just thought it might be visually a bit less claustrophobic to not be completely surrounded by walls. Um, I don't know if we can fall off it yet. We, we might look into stuff like that later. Uh, but we want something that spawns enemies. And I think that if I right click on my scene and say game object, 3D object, let's do a cylinder because I want it to look like a pipe uh, that kind of spews them out. The, it spawned it right on the camera there. <laughs> I, I always forget, like, you can do it via this menu. Or you can right click on the C, you can right click on here, you can right click on the top of, on the scene word itself. Um, I feel like one of these must create it as some kind of same location, but every time I do it, it's at some ridiculous position. Uh, it's never at zero, 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 which is what I always want. Uh, so, what a pipe is going to spew them out. This is the wrong around for a pipe, isn't it? So let's, uh, if we want to rotate it, I guess we can do this with the tool, actually. Um, if we click on the, the, these arrows here, we're in rotate mode, and then we can... Um, actually, I should bring it into our field of vision at least. Uh, and then we'll rotate it so that it kind of points out of the wall. And it turns out that's rotation around the z-axis. If you look over here in the rotation, that's the one that's changed. 
and it looks like it's almost minus 90, so let's just make it minus 90. Um, and then back to move, dig it into the wall a bit, probably make it just twice as big in uh, twice as big in the other dimensions. Now it looks like feasibly enemies could come out of that, maybe a bit lower. Um, yeah, that's all we're going to do with that for now, shape-wise, and then I'm just going to go add component, new script, and we'll call it enemy spawn. Uh, yeah. And when that's finished creating it, maybe it has already. Nope. <laughs> uh, we can double click it, and it will come up with an error. <laughs> no, it's not an error. That's just uh, the last time I had this open. It was with a different version of the project, so it's warning me about that. Uh, so our enemy spawner. We want to spawn enemies. So the first thing it needs is a reference to the enemy. So if we do a public game object right up top, um, enemy prefab, we will set that in the inspector. Um, I guess let's just do it right now. I, I don't typically do things this way, but it probably is a good habit when you define a public variable like that that you intend to hook up to a prefab. Might as well do it right away, because you are going to forget. <laughs> I forget this at least 50% of the time. Um, so sorry, just a, a couple I did there. Uh, Having created that public variable, created the slot there for one, and I've just dragged that enemy prefab from the project folder into there. Remember, again, don't drag it from the scene. Don't even drag, you know, this is blue like it's a prefab. Well, it's from a prefab. It isn't It isn't the prefab itself. Uh, this is the only thing that's the prefab itself. So we've got um, a reference to the enemy we want to create. And then the other thing we need, I think, is a public float of um, seconds between spawns. And we're not going to set that here. We're going to set that in the inspector. Um, I guess, true to what I just said, let's let's do it as we go. Um, and while we're at it, let's rename this this cylinder to uh, enemy spawner. Uh, did we actually create a thing? Did we fail to save it? Fail to save it. Uh, seconds between spawns. Should we do just one second? That's pretty rapid. Uh, but these are small enemies. If they take three hits right now, we might change that. That might be just cannon fodder. Um, and now, so this is a timer. This is, uh, remember, we use these for how often we fire bullets. And uh, as before, we, let's separate this out to put these two variables together. This is our player class. And in order to have our bullets fire at regular intervals, we needed seconds between shots, which is a public float, which we're going to set in the inspector, that's the sort of standard, um, almost like a prefab, no, that's, that's a weird way to think about it, um, that's, that's a, a fixed value, and then um, it's not going to change while the game is running, is what I mean, um, and then the other one we created was, was a second since last shot, which is, we didn't make that public, because we're not going to set that up front, it's not about configuring our player and the, you know, the rules of the game, this is a thing that's going to tick down while the thing is running. So for a timer, you almost always need this. You need a, a standard for what the, the normal time is, and then you need a, a sort of tracking variable to track what our current time is, because uh, you almost always need to keep both variables around. So back on our enemy spawner, we've got seconds between spawns, which is the public one, that's a standard, and then we'll privately we'll do float um, uh, seconds since last spawn. Uh, should we do that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, then we'll just do seconds since last spawn equals zero. Uh, that isn't certainly true. We didn't just spawn one, but we don't want to spawn one immediately. We want to wait the normal period. Um, and then we could do all this stuff in update. I think we'll do it in fixed update. So if I type fixed update and then it auto completes and creates the whole function for us. And I want our, uh, let's see, I want our seconds since last spawn to be increased by time dot fixed delta time. Now I can't remember if we've done any time stuff in fixed update. So uh, I'll write this as a comment just to remind us. Um, fixed update happens um, the same number of times for all players, so it's a good place for gameplay critical things. Um, 
And if you are doing any time stuff in fixed update, you don't want to write time.delta time because that is meaningless. Uh, delta time is the amount of time since the last update, but we're not in update, we're in fixed update. So we want to know the amount of time since the last fixed update. Um, and if you're really uh, uh, if you're really sort of engaged with this stuff and you're thinking about it, you might ask me, hey, why is that a variable? <laughs> Isn't the whole point of this that it's fixed? Yes, good question. Um, it is fixed for our game while our game is running, but in Unity you could change this value if you wanted. We've actually done this with technical breach wizards. Um, I can't remember why now. I think because we have a lot of slow mo stuff. Uh, you know, fixed delta time. I don't know what the default value is. It might be something like 30 times a second or, or 15 times a second. Um, if you're doing super slow mo stuff, uh, you've sort of locked this in place that fixed delta time happens a certain number of ticks um, in game time. Uh, and if you're slowing all that down, you can get jerky motion, so you might want to change it. Anyway, you don't really need to know that, but I uh, just thought that's a question you might have. So, seconds is last born is being increased, and then we want to check if the second since last born is now greater than or equal to uh, seconds between spawns, then we're going to spawn something. Um, so again, that... that uh, pointy bracket and an equals, that means greater than or equal to. Uh, the equal to thing is not critical here, you could take that out and it'd still work. Uh, and then two things we want to do here is we want to instantiate a an enemy. So instantiate enemy prefab and we'll do it, we have to specify a position and a rotation. We're going to give it our position for now and our rotation, which is transform.rotation. That's for the enemy. The other thing we need to remember to do is reset the timer. Uh, seconds since last spawn is now zero, because we just spawned one. Uh, if you don't do that, you'll get a lot of them. <laughs> um, and is that more or less it? Yeah, that seems like everything. So we already set seconds between spawns. Uh, it's got reference to the enemy prefab. Uh, do I just play? Are we already done? Hey, there comes one. <laughs> they come out as, as lozenges. I mean, they're, they're all lozenges, but uh, they come out sort of like, like torpedoes <laughs> heading straight towards us. All right, that all works. That's cool. Um, there was one thing I wanted to do. It actually doesn't really look like it's a problem for us, but um, like where they're spawning here, it just so happens that the center of this cylinder is, I guess, out of the wall, but, you know, depending on how we want this to look visually, we might have put it inside the wall or whatever. It's not great that our enemies spawn just in the middle of this object. Like, this is just the dead center of whatever the geometrical thing happens to be. Um, uh, we might want to have more control over where the enemies spawn. And in, uh, actually, we did this for a player, did we? Did we do this for a player? Where is our player? Um... I guess not. Oh yeah, I know. So when we spawn a bullet for the player, we just add one to our location, don't we? So it comes out in front of us. Uh, if you want finer control over something like that, uh, which we will here, um, you can create an object, like an empty object that just hangs in space that's where you want the thing to appear. And it's quite nice to do things that way because you can see it visually, so you can kind of know what you're doing. So our enemy spawner, I'm right-clicking on it, and I'm going to say create empty there. And that will create an empty game object that is a child of the enemy spawner. Uh, I believe we covered parents and children before, uh, to some extent. Uh, and what that means is, one of the things it means is that, also for one thing, um, let's move it out here. This is maybe where we want it, it's like the mouth of the pipe. Um, one thing it means is that as I move the pipe around, the, the empty game object moves with it, because it's a child of it. It's, um, yeah. Uh, and let's look at coordinates. This enemy spawner's coordinates minus 24 or something, minus 2 something. Um, this empty game object, its coordinates are 0, 1, 0. Those are totally different. Uh, it should be 24 units away, right? Uh, that's because all of its coordinates are relative to its parent. So, and that's true across the board. Anything, uh, when you're looking at transform, it's always telling you how, where it is relative to its parent. And actually, I don't know if this is technically true in code or whatever, but really all these things in our scene are children of the scene. 
Um, and so all their coordinates are sort of relative in some abstract way. <laughs> um, you don't really need to think about that. Uh, but yeah, when you're looking at anything that's, that's nested in this way, that's the child of a parent, all of its coordinates are relative to its parent, and so are its scale. So if you make, um, if we ended up making this thing, oh, we have made this thing, two, one, two. Um, if this thing was a cube, um, let's try this. Uh, let me explain what I mean. So we are going to use the, the empty game object, but just for now to illustrate something, I'll create a cube. Look, I created a cube. That's not a cube, is it? That's a cuboid at best. <laughs> it's uh, shorter in one dimension than it is in the other two. And yet, look, if I look at its scale, one, one, one. That's saying it's completely even in all dimensions. Well, the reason is its parent is, is distorted in its way. It has weird scales. And actually, this is, um, we don't need this cube right now, but uh, I, in the future, we'll get in the habit of making the parent object be empty. So this is, we created a cylinder to do this. Another way we could have done it is created an empty object in the scene, and then within it, excuse me, uh, then you can click on it and say 3D object cylinder and now the cylinder is a child of an empty object. The reason to do it that way around is that you care what the cylinder looks like. So you're going to want to tweak all, it, all of its um, rotations and scales and all that stuff. Um, and that's fine. The parent game object is going to stay... You know what? Since I'm telling you to do it this way, let's just do it this way. <laughs> um, uh, yes. Uh, what's... Uh, I know how to do this, but I'm thinking out what's the clearest way to show you how to do it. Uh, maybe I'll just start again. Uh, we're just going to delete this. We've got all our code and stuff. The hard part is already done. Um, but I'm going to do things uh, in a way that I believe is better. So we start by creating an empty game object. We're going to add the enemy spawner script to it. Um, that's the thing we already wrote. Uh, we just need to set up the references again. So we drag in the enemy prefab there. Second string spawns one. Um, and this would work fine. Uh, this is just an empty thing now. That we, can't, we can't see it, but it will still spawn enemies. Um, but yeah, if we want it to look like a cylinder, we right click on it and we go to the uh, 3D object cylinder. And now we're going to futz with all this, aren't we? We worked out it was 90 degrees in the Z rotation. Um, it's useful to have a visual, visible thing because it's very hard to tell where something is in 3D space. Uh, and yeah, we do our 2 1 2 scale to get it looking where we want it um, and now uh, yeah this is a better way to do things because <laughs> is it a better way to do things Tom? <laughs> uh, yes it is I just need to set this position to zero 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 I didn't realize it, it hadn't started there um, and yeah so I'll write some of this stuff down because that was fairly uh, elaborate. We create an empty game object and then we create the cylinder as a ch child of it and my rules are that the uh, the root object, the parent, the, the, the basic thing that's not a child of anything else, um, I like to keep that to be an empty game object with its scale is always going to be 1 1 1 um, and its rotation is always going to be 0 0 0. Its position can be whatever you like, you don't need to worry about that, that doesn't um, uh, create any weirdness. And then if you want something to be weirdly scaled, we want this thing to be 2, 1, 2, and we want it to be rotated by 90 degrees, all this weird stuff, that's all fine. We can do that when it's a child or something else. We don't really want to be creating children of this, because then that's when you get that weird thing of, like, you create a cube within it, and the cube is weird. Why is the cube weird? Oh, I actually want it to be cuboid, so I guess if I increase the Y coordinate by 2, but I don't increase the other ones, now it looks in paper like it's distorted, but in practice it looks real, it looks uniform. That's all a bit of a mess. So um, I wasn't going to, uh, as you can tell, I didn't plan to, to get to this, uh, this episode, but uh, yeah, I think this is a good practice to get into. Let's make things empty game objects and uh, any visual elements we make, make as children of them. And then the thing we were in the middle of doing, uh, which we'll still do, is we're going to create another empty game object um, within it. And this is just the three floating point in space that... Uh, that we can move wherever we like, and I want the script to reference that. So we are going to edit the script again, and I'll just do public game object spawn point, and 
uh, when we instantiate, instead of using our transform position, we're going to do spawn point dot transform dot position spawn point dot transform dot rotation. Um, and once it realizes we've done that, we get a slot for it. And now I'm going to drag this game object into that slot. And I'll call this spawn point. So you can have, uh, it's pretty uh, easy to just have lots of different children all within a parent and position them all manually. And uh, they're not going to sort of interact with each other in any scary ways. <laughs> um, if I nested that within the cylinder, and that sort of works. It doesn't really matter that the scale thing will be weird because it's an empty game object, but it's kind of getting yourself deeper and deeper into the weeds. Uh, in general, we, you do need to parent things. You need things to be children of things, and that's very convenient. It's nice that I can move this around, and um, all of its children parts move with it. Uh, but you don't want to do a lot of nesting, and you especially don't want to be nesting stuff under things that have custom scale and custom rotations, I think. So that's our enemy spawner. Um, and uh, we can just check that the uh, enemy does kind of come out the front of it. Yep, that wasn't causing any problem. That wasn't causing us any problems before, but now we can be sure that um, you know an enemy spawning there is not going to be clipping through the wall or causing any weirdness. Uh, so that was pretty easy. Um, next thing I want to do is make them explode on death, and for that I think we need an explosion. Um, an explosion effect. Now, I'm going to stress again here that I'm not an artist, <laughs> I'm not a 3D modeler, we're not going to do any 3D modeling, that's why everything's made of primitive shapes uh, and probably will continue to be uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, we just need this explosion to look like an explosion, look enough like an explosion that you can tell what's going on, <laughs> that you're not confused. Um, and uh, I think a sphere is probably the best shape for it. We're actually going to create it in the scene. Um, and I guess I'm going to break my rule a bit because uh, this thing, I'm just going to create the sphere. I could create an empty game object and nest the sphere under it. Because I've done this before, I happen to know we're not going to do any nesting beyond this. It's just going to be a single object, a single thing. Um, with the enemy spawner, it was worth making an empty game object to the parent because we've got two different things nested under it and we might have more eventually. Um, this explosion, I think, is going to stay fairly simple. So it's a big old sphere. Uh, it's not at all where I thought it was. Uh, zero, zero, zero. Uh, let's just put this near some enemies for scale. Uh, it's way too small, isn't it, for an explosion? <laughs> um, but we're not going to change the scale yet because uh, actually we're going to set this scale in code, I think. Um, is that true? No. Let's let's we will set it scale here. So I'm going back on myself a lot this week. <laughs> uh, do you think that's a good size for an explosion? We might as well set it visually in the, in the editor so that we know. Um, maybe even 5. That's 55. <laughs> That's a very tall explosion. Uh, okay, yeah, something like that would look good as an explosion. So we do. We are going to create a material for this one because obviously it's weird if it's white. Um, and so we'll right click in the project folder, go to create, and then find material. Um, there's. In the material properties, there's rendering mode opaque. That means it's not transparent. There is an option for transparent, so let's do that. Uh, you'll notice it hasn't gone transparent at all. Uh, that hasn't, oh, sorry, <laughs> for two reasons. Um, one is, okay, first of all, let's name this explosion material. Now let's go back to our sphere, which we will name explosion. Then we will drag our explosion material onto our explosion. Um, and now we're going to go back to editing the explosion material because now when I make changes to this, it will be reflected there. But it still hasn't gone transparent. Uh, the reason for that is that the color we're displaying is has alpha, has maximum alpha. This slider is all the way to the to maximum, and alpha is non-transparency. It's solidity. Um, an alpha of well, interestingly, an alpha of zero doesn't make it go totally transparent. It just makes it go mostly transparent. Um, if we went for a really low alpha and we went for a kind of orangey color. It's not great. <laughs> it's not a. It's not an attractive explosion. But you can maybe tell what we're going for. Um, and then what happens if we mess around? Oh yeah, we can make it a shiny explosion. Why not? It's not. It doesn't make any sense that it would be shiny. But ooh, whoa. That's a. Uh, that's pretty wild. Um, 
I've got to remember that, I've got to bleep myself there. <laughs> I'm going to make a note of that. It's about 34 minutes in. So, that's our explosion. Um, and we're going to make it a prefab by just dragging the explosion into our project folder. And then we will delete it. And then I want I want the enemy to create it on death. On death. Um, and actually, when they die, it's going to be the health system that knows about it first. So we're going to do this in the health system. Um, we will add a new public excuse me, public game object explosion oh sorry, um, we could call it explosion prefab, I'm actually going to call it death effect prefab, so we could put anything here, it doesn't have to be a, an explosion it could be a bunch of, you know, chunks fly out, or um, uh, I don't know what the important thing that I want to uh, point out, which I only discovered in, when practicing this episode, was I thought Let's create it in on destroy. When the thing is destroyed, that's when we create the explosion. Makes sense, right? Uh, it turns out you shouldn't do that. If you create something, and we'll write this here, um, don't create anything in the on destroy event. It's only for cleaning up after yourself. Um, so if you create something in the on destroy event, Unity will complain at you when you stop playing the game because Unity itself when you stop playing, wants to delete all the things from the scene that, that were created during runtime. Um, and if when it tries to destroy these things, it creates explosions and stuff, that's kind of too late. Like, it's already shutting the game down, and so you'll get leftover objects in your scene. And it's wild. They, You can see them, and you can click on them in the scene view, but they don't appear in your hierarchy, which is like, reality is broken. It's really bad. So don't create anything in on, in on destroy. <laughs> I learned that today. Um... So instead, we'll create it when we take damage. Because when we take damage, we check, hey, have we run out of health yet? And if we have, if our current health is less than zero, let's, well, first let's check, uh, do we have a death effect? Because we want this for enemies right now. We're not going to add anything to the player just yet. We could eventually, but we don't right now. And we don't want the player to crash. The player has a health system too. Um, if this death effect prefab, we want it to be optional. If things want to have a death effect, they can have it. If they don't, they'll just disappear. And so that means before we reference it, we better check that it exists. And let's do it in the right way rather than the wrong way <laughs> by saying if it is not equal to null. So remember that exclamation mark equals means not equals to. The exclamation mark is means not in general. Um, and null means it's not set or it's been destroyed or there's something wrong. Uh, so if it hasn't, if it isn't nothing, then it exists, and then we will instantiate it. Instantiate death effect prefab at our transform. Nope, not transparency mode. Transform. Uh, there's something I'm doing here that I might not have pointed out before, which is when I'm in the middle of something and it's not giving me autocomplete for some reason, like I've messed up and I'm, I've gone back. Uh, let's see if I can do that. <laughs> okay. What? Okay. So what? Yeah. What happened before is it gave me this. And I didn't want that. And as I'm backspacing, I'm no longer getting the autocomplete stuff. Um, and I want it. So I hit Control J. And when I hit Control J, that uh, forces it to bring up the autocomplete. Uh, yes, I meant transform dot position, transform dot rotation. These are all, you know, the properties of whatever game object the health system is on. In this case, it will be the enemy. Um, and that's it, right? We still destroy ourselves. Um, there's an obvious problem with the explosion prefab itself, uh, which we will discover when we play, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, even though you can't just you can't create things in on destroy, uh, it's perfectly fine to create one and then immediately destroy yourself. An on destroy will run right after, um, but that's fine because the thing we uh, thing we want to stop is when Unity comes to destroy it. We don't want that to end up creating some things that Unity doesn't know how to destroy. So, uh, on our enemy prefab. And again, be careful not to change one in the scene, change the prefab itself, which is in the project folder. Uh, find their health system. They've now got a slot for a death effect prefab. And we're just going to drag that explosion in there. And see if that gets created at least. No. Uh, object reference not centered at an instance of the object. Is that going to be the explosion prefab? Hmm. What's that? My health bar. 
its health bar doesn't exist. Mm. <laughs> I'm not really sure what that is. Uh, let me figure out what's going on here. This did not happen in my test. They're all the same one, yeah. Oh, in fact, oh! I don't know if this before. If you click the error, it highlights the thing in the hierarchy that's producing it. So the enemies all think they don't have a health system. Uh, no, sorry, they, they think they don't have a health bar. Well, don't they create their health bar in, in start? They do. Why are they running that update before they run their start? Let's just try again. <laughs> uh, clear this. That's a bit weird. Do these guys have a health system? Are they different to the prefab in some way? Oh, they don't have a death effect. Why don't they have a death effect? Didn't I just set this? No. Oh, I dragged it to the wrong slot. That's the explanation of both the problems. I drag the explosion to the health bar prefab slot. And we want the health bar to be the health bar prefab. Okay, that's... You probably noticed me doing that and I've been wincing this whole time. Uh, yeah, that's why I was having some issues. And so now when we kill them, we want to see a big orange orb, <laughs> which... Yeah, this is the problem I, I foresaw, is that they will just stick around. Um, and they also, oh my god, they're physics objects! They collide! Oh wow, that's great! <laughs> the whole place is filling with massive golden orbs that we can't get past. Man, this is a game mechanic. This is, we're discovering... Look at this, I created a barricade! It's the perfect crime. Oh no, they've leaked through. <laughs> well, that's a happy accident, and now I'm dead. Um, it looks kind of beautiful, too. Uh, Alright, several things to fix there. Um, the main thing is, I hadn't thought about the fact that it's going to push things. Why? I suppose it's a collider. Um, yeah, I guess we need it to be a collider because we want to check whether it hits something because we're going to have a damage stuff. Um, oh, is trigger. There we go. If we click is trigger that will mean that it it's still a collider for detection purposes, which is what we want. We're going to have it detect whether it hits something, but it won't block things. Um, that is the distinction. So, uh, to make our explosion behave the way we want, we are going to give the explosion a behavior. So, new script. Explosion behavior. And similar to the enemy spawner, we're going to need a timer because um, we want it to, to go away after a while. Um, let's do public float seconds to uh, exist. <laughs> and then a private float of seconds um, seconds alive. Does that work? It clear enough that one of those is, is a count. Um, let's just do seconds we've been alive, which is unwieldy, but it's it's clear. Seconds we've been alive um, equals zero when we start. Uh, again, instead of update, we'll do fixed update because it's gameplay relevant. Um, seconds we've been alive increased by time dot fixed delta time. So starts at zero, every fixed update we figure out how long we've lived so far and add that on to our total. And then um, if seconds we've been alive greater than or equal to seconds to exist, then we should destroy our game object. Does that all make sense? Uh, we'll have to remember to set this seconds to exist in the inspector. Um, and we'll do that now.
And I'll just very quickly test this. I don't think there's anything too difficult to grasp there. Oh, I can check two things. I can check, do they get destroyed? They do. And can we move through them? We can. It's a little bit tricky to show it conclusively, but I can move through those. If I'm alive. <laughs> um, all right. So another thing we could do is... Um, let's have them do damage first. So do you remember how we detect detect whether something has collided? We do on collision enter. And as soon as it knows what we're saying, we hit enter and then the whole thing comes up. Uh, we can refer back to, um, let's see, uh, do we have collisions in player behavior? No, we have them in enemy behavior, don't we? In enemy behavior, oh, this is another shortcut to know um, what I did just there was I hit control T and then just started typing. And if you type, this will find variable names and all kinds of things, but I'm usually using it to, to type in the name of a file. And it's better than going to the open menu because you don't have to get it exactly right. You can just start typing and it'll be like, oh, you mean enemy spawn, enemy behavior? And then just choose that. Uh, I meant enemy behavior, and I just wanted to remind us of what we wrote there before, which is um, uh, in our on collision enter, we look at um, uh, their game object and then we get a component on it and we check whether it's null and then we do some stuff to it. Uh, we're going to do something very similar here. We are going to say, let's define a new variable of type health system. We're looking for it, whether they have a health system. So we'll call it their health system. And where are we going to look for it? We're going to look for it on the collision dot game object. That's the object we collided with. And on that object, we'll do get component and we're looking for a health system. So you can kind of chain things together this way. We know that the um, we have this reference to a collision. We know the collision has a game object. And on a game object, you can always do get component. And the component we're looking for is a health system. So this is us trying to find it. And if we do find it, we'll store it. And then we want to check, did we find it? If their health system not equal to null, then let's have them take some damage. Their health system dot take damage, brackets 10, a lot of damage, enough to kill these enemies. Uh, if we have a boss that might have more than 10 health and zone explosion enough to kill them, but feels like it should do significant damage. I think in Spelunky, uh, explosions do 10 damage. Um, yeah, does that all look right? On collision enter, look for a health system on the thing we collided with, if it exists. In fact, while I'm saying this, why don't I write it out? Look for a health system on the thing we collided with uh, if we found one give it a lot of damage and so this should mean their explosions kill other enemies now and of course those enemies will create their own explosions and uh, so on and so on so what I want ultimately is like to encourage you to like get the enemies to cluster together and then kill them at once it's hard to hit them I've got to say <laughs> okay that is it happening I'm not really sure. Oh, it's not, and I know why. Uh, because we made it a trigger, and if it's a trigger that you, you're checking, that's a different kind of thing, and uh, the function, I believe, is on trigger enter. Is that all good? Does it know what we're talking about? Show potential fixes. <laughs> okay, let me just try, if I just type on trigger enter, Collider other. Okay, uh, let's. I'm just going to delete that much so that we. So that it's happy with us, and then. This is all it's doing here. Is is I should have written on trigger enter in the first place, and now that I have, the name it gives the collision that we hit is. Oh no! Sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's something slightly different with this function. Um, on trigger enter is the same kind of thing, it's when we hit something, but it's when our, our trigger hit it. Uh, yes. Um, and instead of giving us a, a collision, which is a, a set of data about how two things collided and their relative velocity and all that stuff, it doesn't give us a collision, it gives us a collider, which is different. A collider is just, uh, we have a spherical collider on us, a sphere collider. Uh, other things, you know, enemy has a capsule collider, um, those are all colliders. And uh, when we check for a trigger hitting something, it's going to give us a collider back. 
And luckily, our code still works just fine because when we say Collider, tell us about your game object, it's like, okay, sure. Uh, Collider has a game object in the same way a collision does. Um, and that is just serendipity <laughs> in our case. Uh, yeah, sorry. The reason I didn't get that right first time is that in my practice, I didn't notice that the explosion was solid. <laughs> so I made this whole thing successfully. It all worked fine. I just never discovered that the explosions were physical objects. I suppose there's nothing wrong with that. You could do it that way. It just isn't right, though, right? <laughs> I mean, it's okay. Like, one of the consequences is it might push things. I don't even think it does that. I think if you create a solid object on top of some, someone, it doesn't push them out, necessarily. Uh, if, we, if we wanted things to be blown back from explosions, we should do that with forces. Um, so making it a trigger is the right thing to do. And then if it's a trigger, we've got to use on trigger enter instead of on collision enter. And when we do that, we get a slightly different kind of data back, but the code we wrote is still fine. So let's see. Okay, yeah. <laughs> It's like, um, oh, one died on the spawn point, and that's killing all of the others. I've gummed it up. Yeah, that's not the reason that's not going away. It's not a bug. It's that every new one is killing the old one. <laughs> um, okay, that's cool. Uh, we fixed the issue. Uh, we made it exist for one second, which is actually kind of crazy. I think it should be more like 0.1. Um, Yeah, let's, let's bring it 0.1. The last thing I want to do is... Um, I feel we can probably skip the screw-around session today because uh, we already screwed around with, with solid explosions that seal us into <laughs> traps. Like, that's the cool game idea that's come out of today. Um, but uh, explosions just creating full size and staying there and then vanishing is kind of weird. Uh, let's make it grow because that will both be visually a bit nicer and also it will mean when you have get chain reaction, right now they're instantaneous, isn't it? Like when we when one triggers, they all trigger immediately. Um, and it feels like they're being frozen rather than blowing up. And what we really want is one to like pop off and as it grows, it hits the next one and then that, you know, you get to see the chain a bit. Uh, and so that's pretty simple. Um, we can just do that with maths and you know enough that, uh, that you could write that, I think, because you know how to change something scale, I believe. Um, but I want to uh, show you a different way to do it, do I? So basically we're gonna have, uh, in order to have the thing shrink, wait, no, <laughs> grow, it's gonna start at zero and then grow to full size. Uh, we are going to need a value that tells us how far through our life are we? Um, so I can call that um, like fraction uh, let me see what, what's it going to be I'll call it life fraction for now and it's going to be seconds we've you know, seconds we've been alive divided by seconds to exist nope <laughs> you got it wrong both times auto complete um seconds we've been alive divided by seconds to exist so that what that what values will that take over our lifetime? When we've been alive for zero seconds, that's going to be zero divided by one or something, um, and that's zero. When we are just about to die, when our seconds we've been alive is just reaching our seconds to exist, it's going to be one. Um, and over that lifetime, we want to grow from zero to one. Um, and I'm going to... Uh, yeah, I'm going to do that with a lerp so I'm going to say the thing we want to change is our transform.local scale in the inspector it's just called scale but in code we call it local scale um, and so we could set that to something like vector 3.1 and that would be 1 1 1 in all the, all the dimensions um, we actually want it to be uh, something something that changes over its lifetime. Uh, what I'm realizing as I type this is if we could just do vector three. No. <laughs> God. Um, just trying to think of the clearest way to write this. Let's 
say. Basically, I'm trying. I'm hoping to teach you a bit of code that's that's useful elsewhere, and not just in this in this situation. Um, so one thing I wanted to define is what's the max scale we're going to have, and that is going to be vector three dot one times. Um, what did we set it to in this vector? It was actually five in all dimensions. So vector three dot one times five, which is just five five five. That's the biggest we want it to get, and then to have this vary between zero and the maximum scale. We do vector three dot lerp brackets. Lerp is short for linear interpolation, which doesn't really help you. What it means is it smoothly scales from one thing to another. And in order for it to do that, we need to give it a starting value, a which is vector three dot zero in our case. We want to start at zero. Uh, its final value will be a max scale, which we just defined. And then the last value you give is um, they call it t, and it's a value that must be between zero and one. And when it's at zero, you'll get the first value. When it's at one, you'll get the second value. And when it's anywhere in between, it will smoothly scale in between. So that's really useful in loads of situations. And uh, we are going to feed in life fraction there. That's why we, why we made life fraction. We've got this thing that's between zero and one. Actually, it doesn't have to be between zero and one. If you go over, the lerp will... If you think about, like, okay, zero is at zero, and max scale is at one... If you go to 2, then you go to double max scale. So you can do that kind of stuff. It doesn't actually c come up that often, I find. I'm rarely using a lerp in a way that, that where we're ever going to go outside of the 0 to 1 range. Uh, but just so you know that that's not a crime, <laughs> you can do it that way. Uh, so yeah, this should be, just mean we grow uh, over the course of our life. And then at max size, we'll be destroyed. Um, yeah. And just in case it isn't clear, what we write in code is going to override whatever's here. So the fact that we're in 555 here doesn't really matter anymore because our code now controls scale. And it's not the case that if I set the scale in code to 1, that it would be 555 because that's, you know, the 1 times the normal scale or whatever. That, that's not how it works. It will override that with the absolute values. So... I just want to decrease the health of these things because they're kind of <laughs> difficult to kill. Okay, that... Oh, there we go. Yeah, there's something. That's a very rapid explosion chain. Yeah, it's kind of scary to get them, I guess. Okay, let's try and get the biggest horde we can before detonating it. Nice. It kind of zooms through them. Uh, it's actually probably slightly too fast, isn't it? Like, what if we had 0 0.2? Uh, also, while I'm at it, I'm going to make our enemies open the enemy prefab and give them, I think... Where is the enemy? Oh, their health system. Uh, give them a 2 health instead of 3, just to make it slightly easier to test this stuff. Oh yeah, that feels more natural. I mean, it's a bit of a weird effect, it's not... <laughs> It's definitely a metal thing, isn't it? It's not, it doesn't look like a, an actual explosion. But again, I'm not an artist. But making, get, trying to set up a chain reaction is pretty satisfying. And I could see that um, being you know, a fun part of a, of a game with more surrounding it. But yeah, I think that's probably enough for today.